to the Critical Breakdown a podcast where we start at the bottom of Rotten Tomatoes and work our way to 100% fresh. I'm Scott. And I'm Max. And today we're discussing King Arthur rated 31% on Rotten Tomatoes. Yeah. It's uh, the 2004 King Arthur. Yeah, not the one that comes out next year. Is that one named King Arthur or is it just named Arthur? I think it is. it King Arthur Legend of the Sword? God, I'm out. Really? No, but, no, but I want to see it. I want oh, to see it. Okay. Cause uh, after seeing this, I definitely want to see that one. This one sucks. Suck. We'll get into it. Definitely. How you been? Been pretty good. Uh, I think we've both watched a metric poop ton of stuff. Yeah, I kind of blew my load a little early last week because I just like rattled off everything I've seen. <laughs> but there's a lot yeah. that you saw. Yeah. Um, but we both I've saw seen some, some stuff. More. Yeah. What about what have you been watching? Uh, well, I watched Highlander. Mm-hmm. And uh, have you ever seen that one? Never. I it's, think we've watched some clips or something. I think we watched the trailer for Highlander 2, The Quickening. I think that was a uh, zero percenter, maybe. Or it, was, it, was it was down zero there. Yeah. yeah. It was definitely uh, bottom tier. Yeah. But Highlander was actually, uh, it was pretty fun. It's a good, uh, cheesy 80s action fantasy film. Um, You'd think they'd stop at one, right? They should have. Really, they should have because there can only be one. That's what I was getting at. No, I know. It was, a good, it was a good. It was good. Thank you. Um... Which does make me wonder what the quickening is about, <laughs> but I don't really have the energy to like watch it, so I might Google it. Based on the title, what what do you think it could be about? Well, the quickening is in Highlander, okay. and that's kind of when one of the uh, immortals get their power, I guess. Or anytime there's a power burst, it's a quickening. Okay. So I'm guessing, spoiler alert, in Highlander, he becomes the only one. So I'm guessing somehow more people become them. That's the quickening. And it restarts. Maybe a second person becomes one. I don't it's know. Highlander 2. The Quickening. And it's the second one's Quickening. Yeah. There's also a successful TV show based off of Highlander. Is it called Highlander? Yeah. Highlander the series, I think. We're talking 90s? Yeah, definitely 90s. It was during that uh, syndicated 90s TV, like Golden Era. Like, like Hercules, the Xena Warrior Xena, Princess. Okay. Renegade, all those types of yeah. shows. Yeah, um, those three. So, no, this one's good. It's a, it's, it's, it's a, this one's good. It's a canon film. Okay. Uh, like uh, the camera brand. No. Oh not but like uh canon films which there's a good documentary I might have you told me about the documentary though yeah i described them all as films my dad would like i thought that they were like just kind of shoveling out a bunch of trash i yeah i don't Uh, see where the uh, (laughs) speaking of shoveling trash i also watched a uh riff tracks movie called sword and sorcerer yeah yeah. And it was trash. It was bad. It was funny. You told me a little bit. Riff tracks can be fun sometimes. Yeah. It depends on who's doing the track. Um, yeah, this... Uh, I prefer Mystery Science Theater. Definitely. Uh, there's one I really like called The Final Sacrifice, maybe? Anyway, that one's really good. This yeah. one, uh, it was all right. Uh, the movie, honestly, itself was funny enough where it didn't need commentary. But at the same time, um, I mean, they had a couple of good riffs yeah. here and there. When what was it a riff of? What's that? You said it was a riff track of, um, what was the movie called? Sword and Sorcerer. I might have not said okay. that. You, you, but, uh, you did say yeah. it, but I wanted That's to... That's just like a fantasy, it's okay. a sword and sorcery movie. 80s? Um, 80s? Early 80s, I would say. Uh, they. <laughs> it ends with a, a sequel title card that says, like, stay tuned, because we'll be back in the movie, like, Ancient Kingdom. And it was supposed to be the main character, I guess, moving on. Yeah. I uh, found out they did finally make the sequel oh. in 2010. Wow. And, uh... <laughs> The main character played, I guess, like the mentor in that one, and it starred Kevin Sorbo, who played. Oh, Hercules. okay, yeah. So wow, yeah. So the fans were really holding on for a while for it. I guess so. Uh, a lot of the reviews I read said like it was the worst movie ever made. I'm yeah. Surprised we didn't come across it on our own list. We might have, and then just not considered it significant enough. That's true. All right, they bring in Mystery Science Theater back. I uh, believe I've, on Netflix. I've heard something like and that. And I think yeah. Dan Harmon is either EPing or he's going to be one of the guys doing it. So that should be good. Yeah, I, I wonder think, what movies uh, they'll pick. Yeah, there's plenty of there's plenty of good films. Do you think they'd stick? Because I feel like a lot of those were like 80s and early 90s. It was like ripe with. Yeah, I mean your your vintage retro kind of films usually work really well with that. Yeah, you could probably do King Arthur. You might. Mac and me. Mac and me would be a Mac great one. Me. We 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 could do uh, commentaries on these yeah. shitty movies we've watched. Should we do that? Maybe one day. Maybe a special. Write us in if you want us to do that. Yeah. Let us know if you want us to do like a commentary track on one of these movies we watched. We'll set up the camera so that our silhouettes are there. Yeah. Wally can be in the silhouette too. Yeah, yeah. He has good comments. Oh yeah, yeah. He's real good. What about you? What have you been up to? 
Uh, I've been watching a lot of like the new releases. I kind of want to get a. I'm gonna do a big end of the year thing, and I want to have a good grip on all the movies that have come out. But I watched War Dogs, which I had mentioned on the pod a little bit because I'm a big Miles Teller fan, and it was super bad. Was it super bad? Because Jonah no. Hill. Uh... <laughs> Jonah Hill was the highlight of the movie easily. His character was weird, and he did this weird laugh thing where he'd be like. Eh, 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 eh. I feel like uh, Jonah Hill. He he delivers usually in films. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. I mean, he's such a character on him yeah. on his own, you know. But I mean, uh, everything I've seen him in, he he carries the comedy. And when I've seen him do more serious, not really serious, but you know what I'm saying. Yeah, when he has to like carry, Wolf of Wall Street yeah, or can, Moneyball. Yeah, he can carry those roles yeah. too. And if this movie was a little better, he probably would get some acclaim for yeah. doing it here. But it just wasn't. It was like so dreadfully boring. There's no reason to because it's about arms dealing and. Like, they're in the Middle East, actively arms dealing. Like, it should have been good, but... Is, isn't it based on a true story, or is it not? Yeah, probably loosely based, I imagine, but it definitely is. They're just picking up military contracts and stuff, and it, it's... I don't know. It wasn't even that funny as the is thing. Is it Todd Phillips? Yeah, it's Todd Phillips. I have a weird relationship with that director, So, other than The Hangovers, what did he do? He did Old School. Oh, okay. Which I really liked Old School. A lot of people School. love Old School. Um, Hangover, I liked the first one. Yeah. I didn't, like, love it, but I liked it. Yeah, And then, uh, I... It was a hit. Don't think I even watched two or three. Yeah, I watched two, and it's the same. He did this really interesting documentary on uh, fraternities and yeah. hazing. And it's After like, old I think, school? I think it was before that, honestly. Okay. I think it was, like, his first thing he did. Yeah. And uh, it was pretty grotesque. I mean, it's, mm. like, all shot, like, renegade camera. Like, he's sneaking in and getting a bunch of secret yeah. footage. Um, but it was it was interesting. That gives me vibes of another release from earlier this year, I think, called Goat. The one with James Franco yeah. and um, I think a Jonas Brother was in it. Nick, yeah. maybe. Yeah. Uh, I never saw it, but I got good reviews. That's another one I want to watch. I think watch we watched the trailer. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, but yeah, War Dogs is really boring. And I love Miles Teller, but he was like pitifully dull in this. I think it's mostly the character. Yeah. I got shades of like a Luke Wilson. Mm. where, And I don't even dislike Luke Wilson that much. He hits these parts well where it's like the boring the straight, straight edge man. guy. Yeah. And... Uh, it was just really Todd boring. Phillips seems to rely heavily on that trope. Yeah. The straight man trope. Yeah, like um, who in The Hangover it was out. Uh, Cooper. Was, was it Cooper? No, I, I'd say Stu was more the straight it. Not Stu. Stu was the one who was kidnapped. Um, yeah. uh, the guy from The Office, Andy yeah. Bernard's yeah. character was the straight. straight I'd say guy. in the first one it probably Because Cooper, like right at the start, he stole like field trip money from the school for That's his true. trip and all that. He was like the badass. Yeah. And then... Uh, the other guy was a dentist and stuff. He's like the fish out of water. Though. Yeah. So I yeah. guess that one kind of plays with the idea of it. Yeah. But I mean, Luke Wilson in old school is yeah. definitely the straight yeah. man. Um, and that's what Miles was here, but it was just boring. Yeah. It did this weird thing where it would like bridge the different parts of the movie. They'd like freeze the frame and it'd be like a new act. And there'd be a quote that one of the characters is going to say in the next act. That's weird. It was, yeah, it just didn't work. It was clumsy. So like months would pass between these things. And... I could see that working in something like a, uh, a story that everyone knows. Yeah. Like if it was a very common story. Yeah, like uh, The Big Short or something like that because yeah. that's very public facing. Yeah, like if you made a, a movie about like, you know, like the Bush White House or the Obama White House mm -hmm. and you want some quotes in there, you yeah. can do that with real quotes. Yeah, but this was but, just like lines that the characters yeah, said. Yeah, kind of weird. Yeah, it was... It was. Just, I, I, I don't recommend it. If you want a movie like this, watch uh, watch The Big Short. It's not really like this, but it's really good. Yeah. And it handles like real subject matter better. Do you think? Uh, do you think Jenna will ever do the straight pivot into like drum, dramatic roles all the way? Uh, yeah, I could see him doing it. Some actors, it's hard to separate them. But look at a Jim Carrey or a Robin Williams. Yeah. Those are both massive comedians, That's and true. they made the the step well enough. You just have to have the right part and I think, a uh, strong enough movie. Like, this this also wasn't a drama. Yeah, no. no like, it was supposed to be a comedy. comedy. It just wasn't comedy, funny. Right? No, it was it's just, just supposed to be a comedy, comedy, yeah, and it just didn't make me laugh that much. Um, <laughs> I just got thinking about Jonah and was yeah. like, uh, he yeah, seems he like he has the chops to do it. Moneyball might have been his closest yet because that wasn't a comedy by any means. Yeah. Um, and the funny thing about that one is the character, because Moneyball is based on a true story about the Oakland A's. And he plays Peter Brand, who is a totally different person in real life. In real life, it's Paul D. Padista. <laughs> and he provided a lot of the information to help the author write the book and the yeah. directors make the movie, but he didn't want his likeness in it after uh, the movie went through like development hell. Because originally it was going to be Dimitri Martin playing that part. Mm. And he looks just like Paul yeah. D. Padista does. And then after like the script maybe fell out and they were redoing it, he didn't want his likeness in it. So then they're on Jonah Hill, who looks nothing like him. Like, look at Jonah Hill and Dimitri Martin. They don't look yeah, alike at all. Um, but, I mean, he was pretty serious in that. He, he, wasn't he nominated for the Academy Award? 
I think so. Yeah, yeah I think he's he been was. nominated because they, they make jokes. jokes about yeah, him. and this yeah. is the end. Uh-huh. Um, I'm pretty sure. Speaking, it was. This is the end. That's one of definitely one of my favorite performances he's done. Um, I have trouble after, remembering it. After his encounter with the demon. Oh, that's right. Where he's like, something not chill happens. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Just between that and <laughs> the rescue dog he has named Aja, and when he spells it out, <laughs> two of the funniest things I've seen in a film. So. Yeah. No, he was funny in that. Now that you mentioned it, he was like the antagonist the whole time. Yeah, yeah. Him they did, and they did a good job making him... Yeah, he's like a douchebag, but he's not yeah. as evil as Danny McBride. Was wasn't it at the start where like Jay Baruchel was coming over? He was like, "Oh, dude, your references are so sick, man!" Like stuff like that to him. It just Jay Baruchel was not feeling it. <laughs> I remember that. That was God. so funny. Everyone it, knows that. Yeah. Your references are off the chain, man. Everyone knows that. <laughs> He uh, he reminds me of some people I've met in real life that are kind of like that, and I'm always just like, I don't really want to talk to you. Yeah. So like, he just nailed that performance. Yeah. So. But now we must discuss King Arthur. Yeah. Well, uh, no, we uh, we both saw Akira. Oh uh, yeah, yeah, we did. Uh, yeah. We watched that the other night. Um, Akira is for the uninitiated. It's an a- anime movie from 1988, I think, mm-hmm. early 87. It's late 80s. Um, Japanese anime. It's really good. The story is really cool. It's really fresh. Yeah, it's set in a post World War Three Neo Tokyo, which is a really cool. It's like cyberpunk too. Yeah. It's uh, probably all the cool stuff you've seen in movies that are kind of cyberpunk, like actual live action movies. Yeah. Probably took it from Akira. Yeah, like Blade Runner. Yeah. And- because Blade Runner might be before. Actually. Well, this is based on a a, a manga. manga. Right? Yeah, you're right. You're Which right. might be before. I don't know when the manga was written. Yeah, all that stuff mixes together in the yeah. 80s, though. But uh, but now uh, Akira, or as they pronounce it, Akira. 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 Excuse me for my Americanness. I, that's how I say it. Yeah. I first saw this in uh, like 1995. I think I told yeah. you I was like 10 or 11. Um, 95 or 96, and me and my brother had been trying to get it from. It was just yeah. impossible to get. I think we rented it without telling my parents because it's rated R. It's violent. Yeah, it's There's pretty nudity. dark. Yeah. yeah. But they just thought it was a cartoon. So they're like, sure, yeah. it's a motorcycle cartoon. <laughs> yeah. Like, but, uh, why do we need to sign for this? <laughs> it's a pretty interesting story. How would you describe it? Um, there's kind of like a chosen one sort of theme going on. Um, so the two main characters are Tetsuo and Kanada. Yeah. Um, and Tetsuo is... How did, how did it initially start? Oh, they have a run-in with... Little um, psychic this kid. little psychic kid, yeah, who legitimately is just psychic. Yeah. Uh, and the the cops and everybody are after him. And uh, Tetsuo, I think, runs his motorcycle into him because they're all in a motorcycle game. Yeah. And then he gets brought to this like psych ward or whatever government facility, and he starts to get these powers. Yeah. Um, and then kind of does like his best friend growing up. I think they were in the same orphanage it showed and stuff. And they're in this motorcycle gang together. And so it's about him trying to get Tetsuo out of this facility. And Tetsuo discovering these powers and everything. And yeah. there's a really interesting dynamic between them because they're not brothers, but there's a very brotherly thing yeah. going on yeah. there. And there's some resentment. Like Tetsuo, one of his big things is like, Kaneda, you don't need to, or Kaneda, you don't need to, uh, you don't need to protect me anymore. Like I can yeah. stand up for myself. Yeah. And then he kind of goes out of control. And then there's this whole thing with Akita, which it's so, kind of hard to explain. It's the hardest part to get for sure. But it's kind of yeah. like the next evolution of the human mind and yeah. consciousness. And. That was someone who, I guess, elevated their consciousness, mm-hmm. their mind. And, it was another one of these psychic yeah, mind and people. The other three psychic kids that they meet in the film are all like trying to achieve that same mm-hmm. thought and yeah. feeling. No. And the government has his remains like protected. Yeah, it was underneath like the Olympic Stadium and, in the old Tokyo, right? Yeah, yeah. Because they're in Neo Tokyo, which is right next to Tokyo. Yeah. In this uh, reality, I guess... I think Tokyo was destroyed in World War Three, right? And they make it yeah. seem like uh, nukes either destroyed the city mm-hmm. and that triggered Akira or it somehow yeah. involved with each other. Yeah. There's very much like good backstory that you can't fully figure out. Yeah. Um, you probably could if you read it or mm-hmm. yeah, I bet you watched it multiple help. times. Yeah. No, I really like it. I, I like that uh, the brotherly re- relationship is very realistic in the yeah. sense that the smaller Tetsuo is very self-conscious about the fact like that defensive he's less, almost yeah. yeah and then um they have very much just like teenage boy concerns like yeah. i mean he wants to hang out with his girlfriend he wants to steal his brother's bike his basically motorcycle, yeah. um uh canada canada have you said yeah. it? he wants to uh go talk to that cute girl he ran into yeah. that's like his driving factor besides yeah. saving his best friend yeah. 
So, and then there's this whole thing going on behind it with there's almost like a religion formed around Akira, yeah. who isn't a person anymore that anyone can see. So it's almost a mythological status. And so there's that. And then there's these revolutionaries in the government. And there's some business government background there, too. So there's a lot of different pieces there. What, what I like about it is it's a manga, but it's not childish at all. It's no. very dark. Yeah. It's bloody. It's violent. Uh, like, like there's one, like not rape scene, but... It, almost yeah. rape scene or implied maybe it's an assault scene for yeah sure. sexual yeah. assault for sure um so it's definitely dark i wouldn't ha- watch it with your kids or anything yeah. but um it's really beautifully done too the trigger to watch is i i'd never seen him like he said i'd seen it but a nerd writer did a video on akita and about the lighting in it and because of the way now animated movies can use computers to generate the light and there's not like as much purpose there's still purposefulness there but with an old anime like this, they're literally drawing the light into these scenes, and so it's very purposeful. And you can notice it with one, the cyberpunk backgrounds, yeah. all these TVs and the neon lights flashing off everything, spotlights coming down, and then a lot of the focal points of the combat, it's a lot of like explosions of light, and the way it's drawn is really good. So, And there's just so many cool like moments, like when he uh, jumps up and runs across the motorcycle and kicks someone in the face. Yeah, that was cool. Um, there's the ripping the sheet off the motorcycle yeah uh there is anytime tetsubo's like his energy yeah. power his arm when it like burst and grabs the seat yeah that was crazy everything is just like yeah. cool as hell in it. his breakout was really cool yeah. like the walls are just crumbling around him the lights would flicker and then go out and it's really it's a really cool uh, movie i recommend anyone check it. it's on amazon now i mean you have to rent it but yeah uh, it's much easier to get than it was in 1995 for sure you don't have to sneak <laughs> the vhs past your parents yeah uh, Unless you roll thank, that way. Thank goodness for technology, am I right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So. But now I guess uh, it's time for King Arthur. Wait, 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 uh, wait. We did see Manchester by the Sea. We've talked about it so much right. on the podcast. Yes. Casey, a- Basie Affleck back, <laughs> back center stage. Yeah, new release. It came to Charlotte here um, start of December because it's limited and it's scaling up. Uh, directed by Kenneth Lonergan. What else did he do? Uh, he d- I know he does a lot of theater work. Um, I want to say he did a movie called Victoria, but I don't know if that's 100% right. He has one other release that it had, um, she played Rogue in X-Men. Anna Paquin? It had Anna Paquin in it. Um, I can't remember, but it was like from five or six years ago. Mm. Uh, but this was really as big. This was a, Matt Damon uh, did a lot of the production and I think was originally slated to star in it. Um, before he stepped out and Casey Affleck came in to play that. But it, this one has, uh, it has Casey Affleck, it has uh, Kyle Chandler, Michelle Williams, Michelle Williams. Um, Matthew Broderick with almost a cameo. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, he was, it was a shock to see him. And uh, But my favorite uh, in this was Lucas Hedges. He's kind of a new actor, I guess, breakthrough. He might have done some child acting, but he plays the son of uh, Joe Chandler, which is played by Kyle Chandler. That's kind of funny. Who passes away at the start of the movie? That's like the whole plot revolves around everyone reacting to that and responding. And uh, he did an awesome job. I yeah. thought he for sure was really good. He uh, I was impressed because he manages to play a teenager who mm-hmm. isn't annoying. Yeah, he's completely like you identify with him almost even more than you do with Casey yeah. Affleck's character. He's like a smart ass. And smart ass. Like everybody when they were sixteen was a smart ass. Yeah, and he has like two girlfriends. He's juggling. Yeah. He wants um, to hang out with his friends all the time. Yeah. Like. He, he deals stuff. with his grief by being extremely like normal and having yeah. jokes with his friends, which is definitely yeah. one thing we discussed. That's how we would have dealt with stuff at sixteen. Yeah. So it was it was easy to relate to that. Yeah. Not that I luckily I've never gone through anything like this, but yeah. and Casey Affleck I thought was incredible. Yeah, it's almost really like a job. meme for me to say that, but how about you? No, I thought he did good. I thought he did a really great job portraying a broken man mm-hmm. who uh, continuously throughout the film has to deal with this brokenness and how you interact with other people um yeah. it's if you've ever dealt with any issues that are hard he deals with what i would say is the hardest thing i don't know if we should say it since it's brand new but it's yeah. whatever but uh he deals with a lot of death in his background yeah. in his, in his life tragedy and, family. and uh he carries that with him and yeah. his character carries that with him yeah and you can tell that he he likes listening to people but he yeah. doesn't like interacting with people yeah so that was really well well done on his part. He's definitely uh, reserved, maybe would be the yeah. positive way to put that. But, he, I mean, he's not a healthy person. No, no. Um, and he has his history with Manchester. Manchester by the Sea is a city. Is it called Manchester or Manchester by the Sea? I think the city is just called Manchester. Okay, because there are some cities in New England where yeah. it's like the hyphenated like that. That's because it's New um, England from England where you have like Stratford-upon-Avon and that's all that right, shit. Yeah. So. In Manchester, though, he has his history and... 
I, I think the best part of the movie was the way they unravel that. Yeah. Because it's not really exposition, because it's not anyone telling you what happens. They just show it, and they show it in a really good time and a really smart way, I think. Yeah. Uh, and it, it, I, other than it being a horrible thing that happened, it makes you relate a little bit to Casey's character, I think, a little bit more. Or maybe to understand yeah. um, why he's having such troubles. Yeah. yeah. Um, I will say that's one of my only issues with the film formatically mm-hmm. is uh, that portion of seeing his background was more climactic than the actual yeah. climax of the film. Yeah. And uh, there, I guess there's a couple things that do that, which is that it's a terrible tragedy. Mm-hmm. Um, it's really heavy and you'd probably have to be like a really cold person not to yeah. feel any of that. Yeah. So for it to just like hit that hard in the middle of the film, when you do get to what I assume is more of the climax, it's uh, it's just more subdued and subtle. Yeah, and, and I, I think that was a purposeful choice because yeah. what happens to her family isn't something that just ends. You know, it's yeah. going to be an ongoing thing. And so there isn't, there really isn't a climax to the movie. No, no. Which, like I said, I mean, if you watch yeah. it and you get that, it's yeah. not bad. It's just like, it's kind of hard. It's anticlimactic. Yeah, though. yeah. yeah. Um, I will say I enjoyed how they let things rest in the mm-hmm. film. Uh, there's a lot of shots where, um, like the shot when uh, Hedge's character finds out that his yeah. father died, it's a zoomed in shot from far off with yeah. muted volume as his uncle tells him, his coach yeah. talks to him, he talks and to his friends. it's from these other gu- people's perspective almost. Shot. It's yeah. not moving. It's, it's just like there. you're actually watching from afar. Yeah, yeah. There's, a lot, of, cool. there's a lot of moments where they do yeah. that, where they give you this perspective in... Mm-hmm. I, like I when like they that. when they go to see the body, it's the same way. Yeah, I, I thought yeah. Um, yeah. there's a lot of really good emotional boiling points too. Like there was two or three moments where, like I was, two I was definitely close to tears. If I had seen it by myself, I probably would have cried. Yeah, but I saw it with you and Jody, so I, I didn't. shed the single tear in a couple minutes. Yeah. So. but Michelle Williams was really good too. She was she had a very minor role. I yeah. thought she'd be in it more. Same, but she I mean she's awesome. I thought everything. she was going to be someone he met now. Yeah, because I knew it was going to do a little bit of flashbacking. Yep. But then I realized it's someone from his past. Yeah. So, but that said, I was a little let down because I love Michelle Williams. Yeah. So I would love to see more of her in the film. But at the same time, her parts were so impactful. They're so heavy, yeah. yeah so. If that character was in more, I wouldn't have been able to handle it probably. Yeah, no, but. for sure. Um, I would say one of my favorite moments, because this, this film managed to be both heartbreaking and heartwarming at, at certain yeah, times. Yeah, it was weirdly funny yeah, at times, um, which I think is smart because... It's such heavy material. It's heavy material yeah. and like life keeps going on yeah. and funny things are going to happen occasionally even when you go through tragedy. So for someone who is going through anything like this, one, don't watch this movie because yeah. that would Give be horrible. But yeah. if you did see this movie fresh off of a loss like that it could even help you a little bit because it could you could see the lighter things a little yeah. bit but uh one of my one of my favorite moments and i think you were laughing very hard at yeah. this too was uh he was after the funeral they mm-hmm. were at his brother's house with all the family and friends gathered yeah. and his brother's uh work partner was like lee have you had any food oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> they, they just keep going back and forth yeah. he's like no i had some cheese and he's like well you need some food let's get you some food he's like yeah. i don't want food he yells out to his wife, hey, get some food. And she's like, yeah. has Lee had food? They're across the room and it's yeah, full and of people. Yeah, screaming. You know? And they're going back and forth. And he's like, no, I don't want food. And she's like, I'm going to get some food. It just keeps going. He's like, we don't want it. And he's like, I'm getting him a plate. Yeah. yeah. And it's just such a real moment, but it's so yeah. funny. And if you've ever been in a crowded family like situation, that's yeah. going to happen. Yeah. And Especially like, you could. he didn't want to talk to anyone. <laughs> and even though this guy was probably his closest friend there, uh, they weren't even really friends, though. Yeah. It, like, it yeah. was his brother's friend. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so it, it was really good. Um, it's one of my favorite movies of the year, personally. Uh, top three, I'd say. But it's definitely up there. It's good. Yeah. Um, I mean, they. Uh, they it's really well shot. Too. They take it there with emotions. It's really mm-hmm. well shot. It's uh, it's just what I call solid cinematography. Yeah. But no, it's shot really well. It's. I mean, yeah. I felt the soundtrack was good. Yeah. The music yeah. Playing. There's a lot of um, like so, Kenneth Lonergan has done theater. I know. Yeah. Um, and some of the music felt very theatrical and it's like it was a lot of uh string instruments and stuff there's a know. couple classical pieces that just really yeah classical got the point stuff across, so. uh, one of my favorite things was uh the son lucas hedges character uh patrick was in a band in the movie and the band sucked and sometimes whenever there's like a kid in a band like their band's amazing yeah because it's a movie yeah. But they really sucked, and it was hilarious. <laughs> like, yeah, no, and they kept, it was it was satisfying to see how bad they were. They kept uh, grinding the drummer's gears, yeah. and that just ended up being funnier and yeah. funnier. I like that a lot of the kids in the movies looked like kids. Yeah, and they, they acted, acted like, like kids. kids. There was one scene where um, uh, Lee's dropping Patrick off at school, and these two girls come and knocking on the window, and they roll it down, and they're like, "Are you going to the dance?" 
And he's like, maybe. And they're like, okay. And then they just like leave. And it's such a high school yeah. thing to do. And the follow up joke is really funny because yeah. uh, Casey Affleck's character, Lee, is like, are they your girlfriends too? And he's yeah. like, they wish. They wish. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it was so funny. Yeah. Their, their interactions were really good too yeah. because it was still like an uncle nephew relationship, which is different than a father son relationship. It's like more fun because you don't have to talk yeah. about the real stuff. Yeah. And then, but then they had to also talk about the real stuff because it was very, the best for me was when Patrick came up the first night that Lee was there after uh, Joe died. Um, Patrick was like, hey, my girlfriend's going to come over, but don't, like, in case it comes up, don't tell her mom or anything. And, and then uh, Lee sits up and he's like, is this, do I have to tell you to wear a condom or what? <laughs> like, it was really funny. Yeah. No, they definitely, uh, they hit those beats. They hit the beats yeah. they're supposed to. Yeah. And you had said before you were excited because it's kind of like coming of age mixed yeah. with uh, whatever else you want to say this is, the sense of loss or something. Yeah. Um, but, uh, I mean, it's a tragedy. Yeah, it deals so. with tragedy. It's a good. Uh, it's a good glimpse of this. I, I I recommend it very highly. Yeah, to anyone who was tangently interested. We were. Uh, we really wanted to see loving as well, but we'll yeah, have to maybe I, try to squeeze that in before that's, next. That's episode. next on my list because it so. looks really good. Um, we're lucky to have a good independent theater or two. Yeah, now, that we saw so. it at the Regal Manor Twin. If you're in yeah. Charlotte, and there's some of these limited releases that you're not sure if you'll see. I know that for a while they were showing Moonlight, which yeah. has not come to any other theater. And I've seen other independent movies there. They always have. Uh, they always show them. So that's where I would. I would recommend looking at the shows. It's only two theaters, and they're only separated by a curtain. And we which were, is funny. Uh, we were the youngest people in the theater. Today. Yeah, we saw the first showing. The matinee. Yeah. I'd say the median age in that theater was sixty-five. Yeah, I would agree with that. So, but hey, we all seem to enjoy it. Yeah, I, I, Jody liked it too. I know she, when we had played the trailer, she had said look boring and she says about everything yeah that's true shout out to you jetty but i think uh i think she was entertained at one point yeah uh so i was furthest away from this but at one point there was not the low rumble the loud rumble yeah. of a just a ringing an fart. elephant teen fart <laughs> yes yeah, yeah. and i was three seats away from the guy who who let it rip like a Beyblade. Yeah, you leaned over and you were like, was that you? And I was like, nope. And then and I thought it was Jody because yeah, like, she was... And like... I was like, uh-uh. It's one dude over. Yeah. You got to appreciate someone who, uh, who's who got the cojones to just yeah. let one go like that. If you could rip one in a movie about dealing with death in your family, <laughs> yeah. kudos good, to you. Good on you, man. Yeah. <laughs> but it was really funny. Uh, speaking of ripping one, yeah, should we do this? Uh, come on, let's watch something else first. <laughs> yeah. We're going to be right back. <laughs> yeah. Now let's talk King Arthur. Uh, what is the plot synopsis of King Arthur? Well, overall, it's a demystified take on the tale of King Arthur. At least that's what they say. Yeah, that was the IMDb it's... synopsis, and it sucks. It's literally just says, a demystifying take <laughs> yeah. on the tale of King Arthur. Probably because they weren't even like excited enough yeah. to write about it. Hopefully they didn't watch it, so yeah. they didn't know what to put. It's really more about... Uh, before the Knights of the Round Table can earn their freedom, Arthur and crew have to go on one last mission behind enemy lines. Yeah. At least that's the most succinct we can make this plot. Yeah. And I mean, it's not like it's a uh, a complex movie with all no. these things that we can't boil it down to. It's a movie that's so slow, boring, and meandering that it's hard to come up with the plot line. And I think that was mostly because it was shar- shar- It was sharded. <laughs> It was sharded. <laughs> it was shot as an R-rated film and yeah. cut to PG-13 because Disney wanted it to be PG-13. Yeah. That's a story you hear a lot, to yeah. Movies first cuts getting an R rating and them changing it. But hopefully, for the sake of this film, they had to change it a lot because, man, was it boring. Well, one as thing is. we noticed was the action sequences weren't exciting. Yeah, and there we, were barely any you, of them. You were like, right off the bat, you were like, oh, look, another action sequence where they're not showing us anything. Yeah. This explains that. I don't think that yeah. would have improved the story moments. No. But the action scenes would have at least not been the most boring thing I've ever seen. A, mo- a movie like this, where you pretty much know, okay, I'm not compelled by the story. There's not going to be a lot of twists and turns. There's not going to be great writing. But at least we're going to have action scenes. Yeah. yeah. They were few and far between, and they weren't satisfying. Yeah. I've seen a movie before. I think it's called Ironclad. I want to say it's about like the Hundred Years' War or something. Paul okay. Giamatti's in it. Mm, I, um, I like me some Polly G. And I want to say it has a lower rating, but I thought the action was fun. Yeah. And it's a good like sometimes, kind of background medieval movie. Sometimes that's enough. Yeah. This isn't like that. No. This is just boring. And there's not really an excuse, I don't think. I mean, Antoine Fuqua directed it, and he's done good stuff. He's done solid stuff, He yeah. did The Magnificent Seven, which yeah. came out this year. Didn't he, he did Training Day, right? Yeah. And yeah. that's an Academy Award winner. So, I mean, he knows how to do a movie. Yeah. The problem is, uh, this, this sucked. Yeah. And it has a good cast. 
Yeah, Clive Owen is King Arthur. Uh, Ian Mad- Grufford. I think it's Ian Grufford. I didn't really know. Eon. Yeah, I wrote Griffin? it, but yeah. it's I O A N. Yeah. It's either Ian, Ion, Ion. Eon. I think it's Eon. 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 Maybe it's like Eon. Yeah. It doesn't matter. Ian Gaffard. Mr. Like Fantastic. That. Mr. From Fantastic. the original movie. Mads Mickelson. Yeah, he plays Tristan. Tristan. There's no eyes old, though. No. No. We do have a, a Gawain played by a young Joel Edgerton. With flowing curly locks. Man. Before we continue, let's discuss Mads Mickelson and. and Edgerton here. And your boy, Joel yeah, Edgerton. Uh, they they background characters. Background characters. More compelling in their existence by their... More interesting. Yeah, yeah. They're just... I'm compelled by their beautiful flowing hair. They both had very beautiful hair. For whatever reason, Mads Mikkelsen's Tristan was Mongolian, too. Yeah, he was like a falconer. Yeah, and he was a falconer. That's <laughs> uh, Honestly, Gawain wasn't interesting at all, which other that than one? that's Joel Edgerton. Oh, yeah. Other than being Joel Edgerton, which is funny. I mean, other than looking like he should be in Pearl Jam, there wasn't much yeah. about him. It's but... funny with him, too, because everything I picture him in, he has really short hair. Yeah. Like, loving. He has a buzz cut. Yeah, he plays like a southerner there. Yeah. We just watched... Uh... Smoke and Aces that but also midnight midnight special midnight yeah. special where he has like normal human hair yeah. warrior also very short hair yeah and then in this he legitimately had a past the shoulder mullet yeah jeez. Yeah. and he had some lines but his character wasn't interesting how many movies of ours has he been in now that for the actual show definitely two smoke two. and aces in this i can't think of what else okay. he would be in okay. though okay so he's no. entered the pantheon he's in more than one yeah he's uh your medals in the mail joel uh if if you we'd love to have you on the pod too anytime you're uh, joel uh, i'm speaking to you now you are one of my favorite actors uh, this year i've seen a lot of your stuff and really appreciated it so uh, that's a special message <laughs> just for you for some reason staying in the pod <laughs> yeah sure uh we also have hugh dancy, hugh dancy. Uh, he was here he was galahad and he would later go on to star with mads mickelson in hannibal, hannibal yeah. yeah great show I've never seen it. I've seen three episodes. I've heard good stuff about it. I've been meaning to, but yeah. um, it was. I know it got canceled too soon. That's what everyone said. And wasn't that Brian? Um, Brian Fuller. Brian Fuller, yeah. yeah. Who uh, was? It, maybe he's an executive producer yeah, for Star was, Trek now. He yeah. was the showrunner. He, he did stepped the down. Developing of yeah. Star Trek. Uh, so. And he's also doing American Gods on, oh, yeah. I think, Showtime. Yeah. But that's based on the Neil Gaiman series. Yeah. He's done other stuff too. I know. Um, uh, we also have our love interest, Kira Knightley. Kira Knightley. Uh, I know my sister's a big fan. Yeah. She likes how she uh, purses her lips in every yeah. scene. How can you not? Yeah. But she played Guinevere. Guinevere. And then our main antagonist, other than the whole movie, is Stellan Skarsgård mm-hmm. playing uh, Sir Dick. Sir Dick. <laughs> we had your boy, Stephen Delane, in here as Merlin. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Stannis, Stannis the Manus, the true king of Westeros. <laughs> That's for he, another club. Uh, he played Merlin. Yeah. But you wouldn't know because I think it was about two thirds of the movie where they said that's Merlin, even yeah. though his character had been there the whole time. Whenever I picture Merlin, I picture like a robed old wizard. Yeah. Not a tribal shaman. So the thing they were trying to do with this movie was ground it in history. Which I think is a mistake right off the bat with King Arthur. With Even though the books may have been written there, you I don't think you do that anymore. Well, it's like, it, it's... It itself is a legend. Yeah. And it's too hard to ground it to just one thing. Yeah. Because when you really peel apart the history, I believe, I can't I can't vouch for this 100%, but I believe it's like almost a collection of stories that have been added to in different eras. So I how can you pick it, just no. one point? I mean, it, it's not like the, the Bible, but it's kind of like how the Bible has been added to upon generations. And so like the version we have now was kind of agreed to, kind of jumping back to, uh, uh, what's that, Da Vinci Code? Yeah. That whatever council of nicene or whatever something like that you know <laughs> so with these legendary stories it's hard to just pick down one yeah. nugget of truth i bet you i mean was this kind of like a bardic tale at the start probably where it's just passed down like that and then I mean, maybe i don't know this wasn't but... this better not have been <laughs> yeah so I mean, this is unspeakably like, uh, dull the knights of the round table were actually uh like eastern european horse riding warriors that were taken by the Romans for 15 years for them losing a, a war yeah, and then conscripted to the Roman army for 15 years at Hadrian's Wall yep. in uh, Britannia and they served under Arthur who was Roman. Well and part of the thing here too is that debt that was paid then all those people's sons had to pay it through time so yeah. it was like hundreds of years ago that that deal was yeah. uh, struck is what I got out of it and now this is probably like 
fourth or fifth generations of these conscripted soldiers. And it's just, it's, I guess it could be compelling if you just made it more interesting. The start of the movie is Lan- young Lancelot getting uh, kidnapped, right? Yeah. Well, or not kidnapped, conscripted. conscripted. Yeah. And it was really weird. They took him from his tribe and then the tribe just started like yelling at him. His yeah. tribe, they're like, yeah! They were yelling at the thing that the characters yeah. yelled throughout the whole film. I never got it. It sounded like roost and I was like, roost. Sure, why? <laughs> Yeah. So I didn't get it. Yeah, I, I don't. But, um, I don't get it with a lot of this movie. We had Clive Owen as King Arthur, like yeah. you said. Now the studios, uh, he he got the role, but other actors that were considered were Russell Crowe, yeah. Mel Gibson, and Hugh Jackman. But they had turned it down. I'd love to see any of them do it. Exactly. I, I do like Clive Owen though. But uh, I do like Clive Owen. Jerry Bruckheimer, he had uh, vetoed the director's choice, who wanted Daniel Craig, because he was convinced Clive Owen would be James Bond. That, that sound you hear everyone is irony. Yeah. So his idea was we'll get Clive Owen because him he's being on, James Bond will push the, the shelf verge. life of the DVD for like years. Yeah. I think uh, I think uh, Clive Owen would make a good Bond. Yeah. And I think Daniel Craig would make a good King Arthur. So. Yeah. There's been talks about Craig stepping down from Bond though. I don't know if that's been ironed I, out yet. Because I, I think the series is getting a new director and everything. Yeah. Too, right? I think I think they should. I think it's been enough time. I think, I think so. the last one was Spectre was disappointing enough in my eyes. Yeah. They tried to dip back into the classic Bond, and it's hard to do that when the d- Austin Powers destroyed yeah. classic Bond. Was it Sam Mendes doing these Bonds? I, yeah, yeah, I think so. I think the direction's changed so much, because there's, like, Casino Royale's good. I I love Skyfall. Yeah. And then Quantum of Solace, I think, was a little weaker, and Spectre was the weakest of them. But they always tried a little different directions, and they never quite found their footing in my yeah. eyes. Yeah. But it wasn't Craig's fault. Craig was a good no. Bond. No, he's very yeah. good. Um, yeah, Craig would have been good in this too, though. But it wasn't Clive Owen's fault. No, no, he was super boring, though. He was super boring, but he had it felt like he had nothing to work with. I think he had a similar problem to how I picture Superman having a problem in modern takes, where the character is supposed to be so perfect. Yeah, it's hard to find that line of both perfection and compelling character traits. And one thing that definitely usually drives the King Arthur story is the love triangle yeah. between Lancelot, Arthur, and Guinevere, which. Uh, I I read that once Fuqua found out there actually wasn't a love triangle in the oldest versions of the yeah. story, he just took it out. Yeah. So then, what's? Yeah. I mean, why are you, in this? What they tried to do was Arthur was driven to get his knights their freedom again, so they were doing this one last mission, and then he was staying with Rome and all this. But it, I, I didn't care. It would have been interesting if they didn't love him. If he was like a hard ass, amazing fighter, but they yeah. fucking hated his guts. Yeah. And he was like, "This is a line in the sand. I'm getting you guys out of here." And yeah. they're like, "We hate you." But okay. But we respect you. Yeah. Like that that could be something you Maybe, play with yeah. in this story. Yeah. In this sense. There wasn't even really rivalry between him and Lancelot. I feel like no. that's something too in the old yeah. story. I never I've admittedly never read a King Arthur story, but um you could have done that. Yeah. Right. I mean, it's just they had some of the tying back to like Christianity because a lot of King Arthur stuff yep. dips into that. And uh, they had a little bit here and there with that but it was yeah, a lot of that early. was with the rome history yeah, yeah. and it was just meh. yeah well luckily we weren't the only ones that thought that this one did have a 120 million dollar budget but it only opened at 15.2 million in its opening weekend july 9th of 2004 that was third behind the second week of spider-man 2 huh. and the opening week of anchorman i saw both of those yeah within I probably saw Spider Man 2 opening week. And I, I saw a and midnight. The following week. Midnight release, I remember. My sister uh, and a guy she was dating at the time, the three of us went, and my sister got me a Spider Man shirt that I still wear to this day. You've seen in, that did shirt. Did we run into you there? I don't know. I mean, my sister would have been a freshman in college, I think, because I was a sophomore I would have in high been school. friends with her then, yeah. Yeah, so maybe. Huh. Maybe. It, it's possible. Hollywood it's, 20 it's or possible. Cherrydale? Hollywood 20, man. Okay. Come on, okay. we're, in, we're not going all the way to There's Cherrydale. There's a 99% chance we ran into each other. Do you think you were at the uh, the Revenge of the Sith midnight opening? Definitely. I. We uh, were there, too. I was in... I was probably in the first 20 people in line. Okay. We were um, further towards the back. Yeah. We weren't overnighters. We got there when the overnighters were, like, waking up. And I was there like, were overnighters? Yeah, I was like, this is Greenville. Maybe they were just, like, yeah. three in the morningers, but yeah. they were, like, in sleeping bags. Yeah. I was like, cool. We, Seems we unnecessary. We showed up at 11 a.m. and yeah. we're good. We um, showed up at, like, 10.30 p.m. Yeah. and we got in. No, we hung out there all day. We yeah. had food coming for us. That's we had someone nice. bring some. I entered a Chewbacca contest. A Chewbacca impersonation. You know what I'm going to ask for. I know. And I won. And let's hear that winning shriek. <laughs> 
I haven't done it in years, but uh. Mm. Oh, that's something, my man. It, it it's needs good. work. It it's needs good. Work. I'm work a little sick. It. I'm a little sick. Work on it for when we get to Phantom Menace. I might just cut in Chewie's noise here. <laughs> I won't tell. Um, shout out to my dad, though. He took me to so many stupid midnight releases and fell asleep in every one. Hey. He big ups to you, Papa Tennant. W- we went and saw Revenge of the Sith twice in theaters. We went to the midnight, and then my mom wanted to see it, so we all went as a family. My dad fell asleep both times, that's which like, I respect. Fair. Yeah, that's fair. <laughs> And, gosh, I can think back now. Uh, he took me to the midnight release of Halo 2. I remember because there was a raffle uh, for a free copy of Counter-Strike on the Xbox, and he won. I made him enter because it was free. Yeah. Why not get that second thing? And he won it. Did he keep the game or did he give it to you? He gave it to me. A good dad. It wasn't a very good port, though. No. But, yeah, so many midnight things. Speaking uh, of falling asleep. The, the midnight release of the Xbox 360. Mm. Like, I was an early adopter there. I had Red Rings of Death three times. Nice. But I remember uh, right after school, my mom picked me up. We went to the Walmart. We were in line. Then at 10 o'clock, they gave everyone their numbers. And we were, like, number seven. And then me and my dad went to Waffle House and ate and came back and got our Xbox 360. The launch title's Cameo and Call of Duty 2, I believe. Ooh, that was a good one. That was a great one. Yeah. Um, speaking of falling asleep in movies, um, yeah. me and Paul, uh, former podcast guest paul for all seasons multi guest yeah we uh we saw attack of the clones together there you go. i had seen it opening night with um multiple guests uh kara <laughs> and yep. uh then we went back to see it again like the same weekend and i think me and paul fell asleep with our heads on each other oh my gosh it's so like almost cute. like we were cuddling yeah because that movie was so damn boring yeah the second one was is the second one the worst of the original trilogy or excuse me of the prequels I think so. A lot of I people so. disagree on if Phantom Menace is worse than Attack of the Clones. Yeah. But overall, I think the story of Attack of the Clones is a lot more boring. Yeah. Phantom Menace is like cringeworthy bad. Yeah. But there's just so little there for Attack of the Clones. Yeah. And, but so. we can agree the third was probably the best of them. Third is the best just for the, even though we laugh through the entire it. The end battle, yeah. The yeah. end battle is good. It's good to see there's the return moments, to the yeah. mythos, but. Yeah. It's hard to pick a favorite there. Yeah. yeah. Sometimes sometimes Phantom Menace is my favorite just because of how laughably bad it is. Yeah. So. Uh, yeah. I, I, were you in on pod racing? Did you like pod racing? I love the video game. I like the video game too. I can't. I, I didn't like no. it. It was too much of the movie. Yeah. It was like 45 minutes of the movie. It's like a chariot race that's not compelling. Yeah. It's like if you made Ben-Hur today and released that, people probably wouldn't think it's that interesting, right? Um, no. <laughs> oh, yeah. Wait. Ben-Hur came yeah, out this yeah, year. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I know I've talked to you before about the Star Wars Minute, which is a yeah. podcast I enjoy. Yeah. Uh, last year they did Phantom Menace Minute by Minute. Five days a week they do an episode. And they usually have good guests and stuff. It's a fun podcast to check yeah. out. They just started Attack of the Clones. And you can just hear in their voice every day how hard it is yeah. compared to the last movie. And uh, I'm waiting for them to get to the good moments. Yeah. Because those are genuinely fun. Like Death Sticks. Why were they buying Death Sticks? There's some drug dealer in a bar that's like, hey, you want to buy some death sticks? Like, that's going to be yeah. fun. But overall, that movie just sucks. I can't even sucks. remember. It's been so long with for good reason that I've yeah, seen yeah. Attack of the Clones. I mean, where do you... How do you even... There's just... Yeah. I feel like the 2000s was a big exploration with digital filmmaking. Yeah. And I think this was a fail. Yeah, for sure. But... I mean, it goes back to King Arthur. There are certain things here that are just... One of the other trends you saw in films of the time was trying to deconstruct. Yep. Deconstructing mythology. That happened with superhero stuff. Um, you have good ones who do it, like Christopher Nolan kind of deconstructs the Batman story. Yeah, I would agree. And then you have people doing stuff like this, where they deconstruct King Arthur, and it's just bad. You brought that back to King Arthur somehow. God, I love that. That's why you're a good podcast host. I had to after... I did one crazy one last week, and it Yeah, just, the, the, the last it, week's... I, I'm just going to say it, it wasn't as good as this week's. Because yeah. this week's, that was really good. I really like what you did there. One day we'll uh, deconstruct the, uh, the bring it back. The segues. Yeah. The only thing that stinks about segueing back to King Arthur. Is we have to talk about it. Yeah. Uh, do you want to... I don't really want to go beat by beat on the plot no, on this one. there's no point. It's so boring. There's a battle at the start that just sets the stage, but you don't know who they're fighting or why. But this is where we see that Mads Mikkelsen has a falcon and that Joel Egerton has a mullet. Yeah. That's the significance there. They are at like some tribal village. They have to go on this mission to get their freedom. They go on the mission. Kara Knightley's character's weird. 
I think she has a broken arm at the start, and then yeah. she doesn't because then she's shooting. She bows. fixes it, or like yeah. she like she had this weird like screamy moment with Arthur where yeah. she's like touching him. She's like, ah! it's, and then she's fine after that. It's a really weird moment because uh, his line there is just like, "I promise I won't let anyone rape you." Yeah, yeah. And then Lancelot's like in the window just watching. Yeah, maybe that's what he meant. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and then we have there's legitimately three battles in the whole yeah. movie. We have our second battle, which takes place on a frozen lake. And is there's not even any action. They fire bows for four minutes, just mowing down this other army. And this other dude just runs up and starts going ham with an axe on the ice yeah. and breaks the ice before they can even really. Oh, that battle. was uh, that was the guy like from Rome. Yeah. Um, Ray Stevenson. Stevenson. Yeah. 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 And everybody was fine, right? Except maybe Ray Stevenson. Yeah, he gets hit with an arrow, then falls in the water. Yeah. But like he breaks the ice to capture the other army yeah. under the ice. Yeah. It's stupid. How much does the Saxon army weigh? Enough to break the ice. Uh, then they get back to that like tribal Roman village. They get their freedom. Arthur's mad for some reason because maybe he's not free. He's still a Roman. And yeah, I, I think basically he's pissed because like the knights are leaving. Everyone's leaving. The Romans are leaving, and the the Wodes, which were the tribal folk yeah. that were Britannia, were gonna get overrun by the Saxons, and the Romans were like, "Tough luck, man. We yeah. out." Well, the knights were like that. Yeah, the knights, the, knights, yeah. the knights were like, well, we're free now. Yeah. So then there's this scene where our wodes, led by Stellan Skarsgård, are getting ready to either invade the village that they're at or just go after the, um, the Saxons. The, the Saxons. Yeah, this is the is end. By, by Stellan Skarsgård. Oh, yeah. I'm yeah. sorry. Yeah, I mixed yeah. that up. The Saxons, Very uh, led by Stellan Skarsgård, <laughs> are going after the wodes with Karen Knightley and... Um, Stannis Baratheon, yeah, yeah. who's Merlin, who was so unimportant in this movie. Yeah. Why make him Merlin? Yeah. Why waste that? I guess yeah. you have to have or Merlin. Or introduce him, like, right the fuck away and be like, yeah. I'm a shaman, but I'm switching sides because I see something great with you. Yeah, something like, who could, I don't know what you do. I mean, it doesn't matter. They also did the sword and the stone in a stupid flashback, <laughs> and it was so pointless. Like, I think Merlin and Arthur were talking, and Arthur was just like, yeah, it's like that time that... I got this this sword. Okay, it's like when you killed my dad. Yeah, and they like showed the flashback of Merlin doing whatever, child Arthur running, just pulling the sword, and that was it. It's almost like how Pan ruined those pivotal moments by not having them. Yeah. This ruined them by having them in horrible ways. Yeah, it's underwhelming. Yeah. It's like, uh, he, yeah. Got, he got a sword out of a stone. What <laughs> yeah, do you want? That's what you asked for. I guess the dead people under the water were the lady in the lake. What? <laughs> Um, oh, under the lake, under the frozen lake. Yeah, I was just. Yeah, I don't know. I, I didn't even I'm catch. Dead, about there that, were dead but, uh, people. Were there dead people? Yeah, uh, at one point the dude. Oh yeah, they yeah, could see. Yeah. I remember because I had a. Um, you had a Hobbit. Right? I had a Hobbit yeah. Battle of the Five Armies uh, trigger moment. Talk about bad movies. That's a bad one. Would you rather watch that or this? That one ticked me off. I, I almost fell asleep in the theater. I remember having to get up and get popcorn, just to get up. And then when I came back to our seats, me and my mom were seeing it. My mom was like what's happening and she was there the whole time <laughs> like that was a really bad movie the whole trilogy was pretty bad which do you think was the best of those three though I always say the second one the second one yeah, yeah. So we've but, talked about this answer my question what would I rather um I would rather watch that that's fair you at least get Martin Freeman you know Bilboing around <laughs> you get Gandalf you get uh you get a lot of orcs dying Evangeline there's Lily? action you have Evangeline Lilly you have Evangeline Lilly there's my a lot of action in is higher that. than my Keira Knightley stock Really? Yeah, I like her better. Than yeah, no, I can get them with that from Lost is why, though. Um, but yeah, I'd rather watch Battle of the Five Armies. That's fine. Uncle Dad's in it. He dies. Yep. Spoilers. Wow. Everybody dies. I guess we already spoiled Highlander. So. Yeah. Um, the ending of this movie, though, the the Wodes and the Saxons are about to fight near the wall for whatever reason. This is the wall. Yeah. And then Arthur's like, I'm going to have to fight the Saxons by myself. He's getting ready to. And then the knights just show up again to fight. Yeah. Most of them die. Oh, there was one really stupid worth mentioning scene here. The Wodes are in this forest far away from the battle at the start. And they just start like loosing arrows over at the other army, which is fine. But then there was this one Roman traitor who had been with the Saxons who had climbed up this tree to hide in the battle after he's like, yeah, that's where Rome is. And they were like, thanks. <laughs> and he's up in this tree. And then five minutes later, Kieran Knightley randomly shoots an arrow from lord knows how far away but that just goes right into the tree and kills him and he just falls out yeah those it, english archers man they're uh, it they're was dead. laughable though oh totally because there she wasn't anywhere near that when it happened so it's not like she knew yeah and it was like a no look shot 
Who's all of our Game of Thronesers in this? I mean, we talked about Stannis, right? Stannis. There's two more, I think. Um, I think the guy who gave away Lancelot in the beginning was uh, the Blackfish. Okay. And then I, I think like there's one that. more, but I don't remember. But they're at they're at the wall. Yeah. Hadrian's Wall, which is what the wall in Westeros is based off of. So that's kind of cool. So maybe that's your third Game of Thrones alum. Maybe. The wall. I feel like there's somebody. It doesn't matter. The end battle is the knights and Arthur against this huge army, right? Because they didn't have like the Roman army with them, right? Yeah. I don't think it they was did. just him and the Wodes. It was just the six of them. Oh yeah, and the Wodes. They had the Wode, Wodish army. Wodish. Um, and so Mads Mikkelsen dies in this battle very unceremoniously. Yeah. He duels with Stone Sar- Skarsgård with Sir Dick, and um, and he died. And then Arthur fights. Oh, and then Lancelot dies too. Yeah. Fighting the same guy, or was it his son? Because Sir Dick had his son Psyduck or whatever yeah. with him. Psyduck. Yeah. Uh, and then the movie ends, and there's one more thing that was disappointing. At the start of the movie, they foreshadow Lancelot's death. By he just says, for whatever reason, to someone, He's like, If I die, I want you to scatter my ashes in a strong eastern wind. A strong eastern mm-hmm. wind. So they burn his body at the, at the funeral, but they don't show him scattering the ashes. It's a shame. It's a shame. He had one wish. He had one it's like wish. It's his fucking living will. Yeah, it is his living will. And that's what they do. He, they, he fell in battle. Yeah. Arthur, I'm looking at you. Yeah, Arthur, that's on you. Maybe, maybe there wasn't a strong enough eastern wind and he was just waiting. Maybe. Yeah, he's just waiting. Yeah. It's like frozen ground. You the can't the movie should have ended with a scene of him like just facing east. Like, the show a compass and him facing east and just like waiting with his like urn. Instead, it ends with a grand wedding yeah. between Guinevere and Arthur. Yeah. And Merlin officiating the wedding Naturally. as the natural shaman in the group. Yeah. And uh, they hold up Arthur's sword and they start yelling out that same thing they were yelling. Roost! Yeah, which makes no sense because yeah. I think there's only one or two left of them now. I have no idea what this uh, says. so bad. Why does this movie This exist? was the best part of the movie that it ended, though. Yeah, yeah. I was this, telling you, I was like, I was more interested in the wedding scene because at least it was colorful and weird. Yeah. And then the movie ended. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's the, it. The tough thing about this movie, too, is like, it wasn't shot well, but it was shot fine for yeah. like a Gone in 60 sec for a Jerry Bruckheimer movie. Like, yeah. you don't expect cinematography to rival like Roger Deakins or anything, but you get normal stuff. The coloring was really washed out, which I hated. Yeah. I think they uh, did it on purpose. There's I a lot read. of greens and grays, which might have been like an They're going England for the thing. Dreary England thing <laughs> yeah. that I find out. They filmed it in Ireland in like the peak of summer at like record highs. <laughs> so it probably just looks normal yeah. if you de color time it. And yeah. it probably looks fine. Okay. But it's so washed out. Yeah. And every scene is bland because of it. Yeah. Even the ice scene wasn't like all that white it was gray yeah and that wasn't great it's that either. like post matrix yeah. coloring and whenever i see rome i always picture like this bright red armor but all these guys were wearing like black armor and loins or like mongolian furs yeah. for some reason and i mean that's the thing it's like i get that you don't want to do the golden red yeah armor arthur though maybe could he maybe could um because he's actually roman yeah and i think the uh i've seen a different variety of, yeah. of different armors and you yeah know, photographs time, and stuff yeah. like that but so it all depends but i wouldn't mind that so much it's just like it's weird to do the whole night thing mm-hmm. if it's roman time yeah because like the chivalry knights we think of is all like french yeah so that's true <laughs> it's like if you're gonna de like you know demystify and really deconstruct yeah either make it like better <laughs> and it's more compelling or just don't do it regardless of what you're doing make it better than yeah. this yeah Make it more compelling, yeah. for sure. Give us a story we care about. Yeah. It was just, man, it was so boring. And the action was bad. They would do that thing where right as the hit's about to come, they'd cut to the guy falling backwards, yeah. which yeah. is what you have to do to PG-13 and our movie. Yeah. yeah. So it makes the action not satisfying because you don't actually see anything happen. I bet you this would have gotten a higher rating for sure if they showed the action. I get why they moved to PG-13 for audiences, yeah. though. Uh, but now the w- knowing that budget, I see why they went PG thirteen, yeah. and it's Disney too. Yeah. Uh, if now, it was like half the budget, I could see them sticking with R. Uh, in a post Deadpool world, which is a weird sentence, but Deadpool honestly did kind of break the mold for an R rated movie succeeding with a big budget and having a huge audience and yeah. staying power. Now you're going to see more action movies like that. Logan's going to be rated R. Um, I, I'm not sure if the um, if the new King Arthur by Guy Ritchie is going to be rated R, but 
Uh, it just kind of changes the way that they make. Because this is a pretty cookie cutter action movie yeah, when you think yeah. about it. Like no offense to Antoine Fuqua, but yeah. it's not. I mean, it's not really digging into the history. Either. It's not like an epic, like yeah. Braveheart that I've mentioned yeah. many times, yeah. um, which was rated R. But with your dramatic epics, yeah. you can do that if it, you have enough clout. Yeah, and this is almost a, a different film than Braveheart. Braveheart is kind For of sure. a prestige film, almost. Yeah. yeah. Uh, kind of like Hacksaw Ridge is, yeah. where. They're very historical, and I know we've talked about the inaccuracies in Braveheart, but it's kind of a different audience you're going for. Yeah. This is going for that big budget, big opening weekend, kind of like we see with comic book movies it's a now. It's movie. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, like Gone in 60 Seconds like is the same yeah. way, and like Pirates of the Caribbean is the same way. It's not an authentic pirate yeah. movie, no, 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 but no. you're going for that fun action with maybe grounded in some It's just funny because like, they pushed pirate. King Arthur as... An authentic King Arthur. Yeah, that was, based the, in realism. That was the turn on this one. Yeah, so one. it's like... I remember big marketing on this one. Yeah, oh yeah. And it reflects that $120 million production I budget. those flaming arrows, like doing the slow-mo and the yeah. commercials and trailers. Yeah, there was one scene where they did that, and I don't even think it mattered. No. no one guy got lit on fire. I remember because, because the Saxons all did their shield wall with their bucklers. Yeah. They had tiny little shields to make their shield wall, and one guy behind her just got hit by... The arrow, and then they made a scene of showing all this tar that they were spreading out, and he yeah. lit the tar on fire, yeah, and that was that, it. that was it. Like, every bit of action you see in this movie, you've seen in other medieval war movies. Yep. yep Most of sure. this has been done specifically in Braveheart. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No so, doubt. And it's done much better. Watch oh, yeah. Braveheart. Yeah, watch that, Braveheart. That one, Best Picture, in 95, didn't it? Uh, probably. I think it did. Yeah. Uh, I think it did because I think there were some people who weren't happy about I it. I make fun of how all the Scottish men look like Danny McBride in that film, yeah. but I genuinely enjoy Braveheart. I could have used some Danny McBride in this one. Hell yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the other thing about King Arthur, uh, it's it's so natural that it had a shitty video game come out alongside it, and it did. It's <laughs> like feel, a movie made for a I, crappy we video game. I think every movie yeah. for like two years had a shitty video game released with it, and yeah. this was one. Minority Report was one we talked yeah, about. Yeah, t- I still haven't uh, seen any of that. Uh, Other I, than the ragdoll physics, there was nothing yeah. there. The best like video game adaptation game or movie adaptation video games are the Two Towers and the Return of the King had good ones, and they were just like action spammy yeah. button mo- games, but they were fun. And our Fellowship of the Ring wasn't as good because it was a totally different game and studio. Yeah, I couldn't think of really. I mean, I know there's been some Incredible Hulk had a good game come out alongside it. The Lego Star Wars games are actually really fun, but that's yeah. a little different too. You got your uh, your old Sega Genesis, uh, Lion King, and Aladdin, Aladdin games were good. A- Lion King was annoying. It had that level with the giraffes. That nobody could beat? There's someone who knows what I'm talking about. the fourth or fifth level? Uh, yeah. yeah. And the giraffes were like moving their heads and you had to jump on top of them. Yeah. Uh, Aladdin was a great game. I remember you threw apples at people to like knock them out when you would go past. Ooh, I think my favorite. The best part about the Aladdin game, though, there was a, um, a scene on the magic carpet with the whole new world playing in that like because this was back in 32-bit graphics and it was um like the sounds are different i don't know how to describe the sounds from those games maybe you can help me there like in those old genesis games the sounds on them it was very like um staticky almost like a synth yeah. almost yeah but that version of a whole new world is wonderful and you're on the carpet and you got to collect these gems and you're ducking down and at the end everyone shoots fireworks out if we can find it i'll end with that wonderful <laughs> um, one of my favorite movie games was yeah. Terminator 2, the arcade game. Oh, arc- arcade games are almost different, though. Yeah. But this one was released for console. Okay. So it's one of the hardest games I ever played. Huh. In high school, one time, I was feeling down, and a couple of my other friends were feeling down. I think Taylor might have been in the group. Yeah. Uh, we decided to skip that day. We were either juniors oh, or seniors. They can still get you for that. We stayed home. And we finally beat the level of Terminator 2, the arcade game that we had been stuck on for like 15 years. <laughs> so Worth it, it took, it was probably more like 10 years, yeah. but still, still it took, take it. It took the entire day. We finally beat it. We beat the game. You ordered some Domino's home. pizza. Then my mom came home and I just was like, Hey, I felt sick. So I stayed home. She's like, okay, there you go. It's good times. And then you were feeling better because you beat Terminator 2. Exactly. One of my favorite things about the Terminator 2 game is it's not King Arthur. And that's our final thought. I have one more thought, actually. Actually, what you got? I'm very interested in Guy Ritchie's, Guy Ritchie's King yeah. Arthur. Uh, it comes out next year at some point. I think it's King Arthur, Legend of the Sword. That might be wrong, though. Oh, no, it's not wrong. Uh, it's King Arthur, Legend of the Sword. Uh, Guy Ritchie did the Sherlock movies. Uh, is it Lock, Stock, and Two Smoking Barrels? Is mm-hmm. that him? Mm-hmm. Rock and Roll, I believe. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it's got Jude Law. Uh, Eric Bana, I believe, is in it. 
It was playing Uther Pendragon. That's Arthur's dad. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, but yeah, Charlie Hunnam is playing King Arthur. Is he from Vikings? No, he's from the Biker Show. Oh, um, Sons of Anarchy. Yeah. yeah. And he's in a uh, Pacific Rim. Oh, okay. Still haven't seen that. He plays Raleigh, Raleigh Beckett. Okay. So. But I'm excited for that when it comes out like early 2017, right? March, maybe March 24th, I want to say. Yeah. Yeah, it comes out March 24th. Okay. But I'm just excited for that one because I really like Guy Ritchie. Those Sherlock movies are some of the most fun movies. They're fun. Um, and I think that's the version you do uh, with King Arthur here. You do yeah, you a do fun it big. version. Yeah. You do it big. You do there's, it there's already been a trailer for this one, and it looks just like a Guy Ritchie movie, and it looks great. Yeah, looks like a Guy Ritchie King Arthur film. Who but whatever you're it? picturing right now is what it looks like. Yeah. And uh, after we wrap this up, we're gonna watch the trailer again because I want to. Word. Max, where can the good people find us? You can find us hanging out defending the wall from the woods at thecriticalbreakdown.com. You can find me and Guinevere unbreaking our arms at Max Rivera Film. Uh, you can find me and Lancelot trying to pull the sword from the stone at breakdown underscore Scott. You can always leave us reviews or um, help us learn falconry with Mads Mikkelsen yeah. on iTunes, on Stitcher, any podcasting Google Play. app. Yeah, Google yeah. Play. Uh, you can send us an email at the Critical Breakdown Podcast at gmail.com. Yeah. Love to read you some fan mail or uh, just your thoughts on King Arthur or anything, really. Yeah. Uh, tell us what movies you'd like us to do a commentary for. Yeah. Why not? Do that. Uh, uh, Jason Brown did our music. Yeah. And Josh Rivera did our artwork. Wally's the podcast dog. And we don't have to watch King Arthur ever again. And I see what a wonderful kind of day. If you could learn to work and play And get along with each other You got to listen to your heart Listen to the beat Listen to the rhythm The rhythm of the street Next week on The Critical Breakdown We're going to South Africa With Chappie We caught a plane with Hugh Jackman And his baby mullet Next week on The Critical Breakdown Stop. 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 Stop